Uh, Sunday the 10th, Sunday the 10th, Sunday after Trinity, take two, here we go. Well, good morning once more, Pember family. Um, it's brilliant that we can gather together in public worship. I think that you remember the rules about masks. As you are seated, as long as you're six feet apart, you may pull them, pull them down, but please do, when we stand to sing, pull them back up, or if you want to leave them off, just hum, okay? Before we begin, we have a few people we must pray for. Cheryl, I think you're, you're leaving us soon for, for Leahy for, for surgery, leaving on, on Saturday. So we need to pray for Cheryl. We continue to pray for Angela. How's she recovering? Is she doing okay? Yeah, uh, best thing she was, but she's down uh, minus a car. Minus a car. Minus, a, of course. So Angela is well, but she's minus a car. That's Angela yeah, Marklow. She, she, she's getting slightly better. Good. She, she wants Okay, she'll come back and see us soon. Okay, and so Valerie and Silla, is Silla Silla Hospital. Silla Hospital. Silla Hospital. Silla Hospital. Okay, and Ronnie's okay? He's doing better? Okay, sounds good. And as for Canon Norman, um, the latest reports is that the ventilator tube is still in after the operation on the top of his spinal column where they fused C3 and C4 at the top. Um, he's had some pulmonary problems, including some pneumonia. So he definitely. Uh, um, is, is in need of a miracle or two or three or thirteen so we're keeping him in prayer so let's uh, let's pray for all these things and, and pray that this time will be we give glory to God okay come Holy Spirit and once more direct our steps as we raise our voice to you or through you may um, may our Father in heaven be glorified we thank you, Heavenly Father, for many gifts, especially for the gift of your Son, Jesus, who came to set our hearts right, even when we couldn't do it ourselves. When he was walking with us, he was the author of many miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we thank you that in small ways and large, those miracles continue. We ask your presence, therefore, Holy Spirit, with Cheryl and Angela and Sevilla and Valerie and Ronnie and Norman. Come close to every one of them. Not only them, but also the people who are looking after them. Their family, their friends, their health care providers, from the hospital administration down to the cleaning. Of course, the greatest miracle is when a sinner repents and turns to the Lord Jesus. So we pray that today that his name would be glorified, that we would be edified, and we would be his hands and feet throughout this week. So we continue in prayer, the prayer on the screen which reads, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, we stand and sing our opening hymn, Ye Holy Angels Bright.
Thanks, everybody. Please to be seated. So before we hear God's words and, and take communion, let's uh, clean our hearts in these words of confession. I invite you to, to, uh, to pray them along with me, and we're going to leave quite a few seconds of silence to, uh, for the Lord to speak to us through his spirit. Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God and Father of all, we have done wrong. We have strayed from your fold like a lost sheep. We have followed the desires that the worst parts of our nature have demanded and demeaned ourselves. Nevertheless, you have promised to forgive even the worst offender when they turn to you in penitence, according to the promises your Son declared to his people. Instead of letting us live in our sinful desires, grant us your presence again, so that we may live a new, godly, righteous, and honorable life. For your glory and your purposes. Amen. Grant your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from our sins and serve you and each other with a clean heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So the hymn is going to announce the next reading is O Church Arise. I invite everybody back, our singers back. Here comes our technician as well.
Stay standing because we have a reading from the Gospel today. It's taken from the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. We begin at the 21st verse. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. As we begin um, the teaching moment, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we give this time to you. We ask you to come close to us once more in the presence and power of your, of your Holy Spirit. Teach us afresh today, Lord, and every day, but especially as we dig into your scriptures. We thank you that we have the word preserved for us and that it serves to teach us of the word made flesh. Jesus, your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, please, everybody. So something has emerged in our visual culture in the last few years. I'm sure you all know about it because uh, many of you are in different WhatsApp groups and you get sent all sorts of interesting things. I, for example, was sent this by a Baptist friend of mine. Can you read it? Baptists hanging out with their Anglican friends. It's actually the filming of The Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> That's uh, Peter, the director, and then two of the actors there. The other thing, of course, that we get to see when people send it to us are these lovely little reminders of, of church history. This was sent to me this week. This is uh, the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. You all know it, I'm sure. We even have it set to music. The other thing that was sent to me just before Trinity Sunday by one of my, one of my friends, one of my, my um, people that I, I trained in ministry was this one. How not to commit heresy preaching on the Trinity Say nothing and show pictures of kittens instead. <laughs> Anything to avoid heresy. Now, of course, there's lots of, uh, lots of things that have a religious nature that are sent around these days as well. For example, this is a very famous one. Um, it's taken from Jeremiah 29, 11, and apparently, according to, to a research agency in the United States, this is the most popular Bible verse these days, because it reads like this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Which is lovely and beautiful and all very well and good. But one of the reasons that, that they have these, these, these things, this particular passage goes around as a meme across, across the interwebs. The reason that it's on posters that you can buy in Christian shops or those, those lovely boards that are often carved with pictures on it is because it's become very popular. Now here's the thing. What do we think that means if we just read that like that? If we just read those words, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. It sounds very good, doesn't it? It sounds like he's got some plans for me. That's awesome. And that is entirely out of context. Entirely out of context. Because it comes from Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah is writing to the ancient Israelites... Who were, in the, who were under captivity in Babylon. And this is what, this is the entire passage this is taken from. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will then come to you, come to you Israel, you plural, and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place, back to Jerusalem, back to Judah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. 
Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me where, when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you all from the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is not about our individual plans in 2020. This was written to a group of people who were in captivity. This is about the Lord God blessing his people, the people that he called out of Egypt, the people that continue to turn away from him. This is about what's going to happen to them 70 years after the prophet Jeremiah was writing it to them. It's not about Jesus making us wealthy. It's not about putting our plans before the Lord and him making sure that they all come to fruition. But having said that, of course, we, we read the entire Old Testament through the lens of, of Jesus, so we know, therefore, that the plans that, that God ultimately had for us to prosper us was to send his Son, Jesus. So really, this is not pointing to me or you, this is pointing us all towards Jesus. To the ultimate plan of salvation that's written from the first page to the last page of the scriptures. What I'm trying to say is that context is always important. Context is always important and it is absolutely the case again for today's reading. When we pull things out of context without the broader, without the broader narrative of scripture it's not helpful. Because on the face of it, if we were to pull this, this one bit of scripture from Matthew up out of context and read it without any, anything else, it would sound pretty awful. It would sound like Jesus was basically using a racial slur for the Canaanite woman, wouldn't it? You read it with no context, that's what we might think. And then we might think, okay, well what does that say about our Lord's character? If he's willing to use a racial slur to refer to this Canaanite woman. Okay, so what is the wider context? If I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna ask you to look at the broader context, what is that? Well, I mean, first of all, who are the Canaanites? They were a people that um, um, the, the Israelites were, to, were to, whose land that the Israelites were to enter into through the, through the River Jordan. Remember, this is from the very beginning of the book of Joshua. Moses has just died. Joshua takes them forward. And of course, they were, they were called to take the land that was promised to them, even if, even if it was necessary by force after 40 years in the desert. Canaanites lived outside of the land of Israel. They were idol worshippers, which could include child sacrifice. Not much friendliness existed between the ancient Israelites and the ancient Canaanites. Now, there's another bit to the context of this, of this passage. Where does it occur in the sort of span of Jesus' teaching from his birth to his death, resurrection, and ascension. Well, it occurs at a, at a point in which Jesus' ministry is continuing to slowly unfold. People who wanted, remember, people who wanted that Messiah to come with a sword to drive out the Roman oppressors, he comes and he says, well, that's not actually the Messiah that, you were, that you're going to get. That's quite different. There's been this hiddenness to his ministry, as though it's been slowly unwrapped. His vocation is slowly being revealed, almost like a game of pass the parcel at a, at a children's party. Bit by bit, a little bit more is revealed. Remember right from the beginning, Jesus' first, first miracle, where Mary says, come on, they need some more wine, and Jesus says, oh, it's not my time yet. But now he does, he does do it, of course, but he's very careful to reveal himself slowly. This is why he says things such as, and when he, when he heals particular people, he says, shh, Keep it quiet. And then eventually he'll say, now go give glory to God in the temple. There's a slowly, slow unwrapping to his ministry. We must note also that there is a context here, and that is that Jesus himself says that I came to the Israelites first. The Israelites do get the plans to prosper first. But of course, at the very end of Jesus' teaching, tells parables about how the heirs to the kingdom, as in the Israelites, will be on the outside, and the guests, that is, the Gentiles, 
will be seated at the table with the master, enjoying the benefits of being in his kingdom. And what's outside? What's outside is weeping and gnashing of teeth. We also have to note that Jesus uses the cuts and thrusts of a rabbinical style of debate to increase people's understanding. You know, sometimes people think that it was only Socrates who used questions to get at the heart of the matter. Well, just look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus. And even look at the way God the Father, throughout the Bible, answers our questions with another question of his own. Sometimes those questions feel pretty harsh as well. So what's my point? My point is that as Jesus' true ministry is slowly but surely being unwrapped, slowly but surely being revealed for both the disciples as well as the average person, Jesus is simply using this standard rabbinical technique to test the Canaanite woman. He's actually, I think, testing her heart. And I can't presume to know exactly what he found there. Was it humility as well as desperation? I don't know. But Matthew at least reports that Jesus himself says, Wow, what faith! And who's the audience? Who's watching? Jesus' disciples are watching. So I think there's a didactic purpose. I think Jesus is teaching them, Come on, look at this. Here's somebody that you all, that we are supposed to refer to as dogs, but look at her faith. How little faith you've got. I really can't help but wonder if Jesus is testing whether it, this is something that I say often because it, um, it, I'll leave that. I can't help but wonder if Jesus is testing whether the Canaanite woman just wants Jesus' religious goods and services, whether she just wants all the cookies or not, or whether she has really seen and come to believe that he is the son of David something that was hidden from the children of Israel. The heart of all of what I'm saying is, is that race and nationality and gender, those all come second to the heart. Just before this vignette, just before our reading, there was another reading in which Jesus says, says that Lot goes into the body that doesn't matter. As it just comes out again, it's not what comes in that defiles you. In fact, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you because that reveals your heart. That reveals your character, not what goes into your stomach. In other places, he'll say things like, rend your, rend your heart and not your garments. It's all very well to do an outside show, but if your heart remains evil, what's the point? Jesus is after our heart status. He was after her heart status, and Jesus could read hearts. And he cares more for her heart status than he does for her ethnicity, or her color, or her wealth, or her job, or her status, or her gender, or her fame. So at the very least, this story should, should prove to us that real equality exists outside of all those categories. Real equality exists in our hearts. What I mean is that no one gets to lord it over another person, to look down on somebody else and say, well, I may be a sinner, but at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Because the biblical response to every one of us is that all have fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Including the dude up here in the smock. Surely not I, Lord. I'm not that bad. Closely your thoughts throughout the day. Closely your thoughts during your interactions with your friends and your families. Let's say that you were one day to say all the thoughts that run through your head out loud. How many of you would have friends? How many of you? How many of you would lose your job? How many of you would be disowned by your parents or by your children? How many of you would no longer be married? My wife laughing hardest. <laughs> this, is, this is not the first time you've, you've heard this, but it bears repeating because if you're anything like me, you don't like to hear it, but you need to hear it. All have fallen short. Kings, princesses, the rich, the famous, the powerful, the governors, the leaders, the pastors, the bishops, me, all of us have fallen short. 
This is the thing that makes the good news good, as opposed to just ordinary. That's that this free gift of eternal life is open to all who fall short of God's glory. All who fall short of God's standards. All who fall short of God's commandments. Which is everyone. That means that we all have good news, not ordinary news, to share. Now, if we retain that attitude that places more importance on our status or ethnicity or job or race or wealth or family, if we put more emphasis there than on God's grace, then we are not being good messengers. We're not bringing the good news. And I think that the woman's story from last week proves it. She was looked down upon by Christians, the very people who should equip, who should believe that everybody has equality. Our heart's attitude, what comes out of our mouths, that can damage Jesus' reputation and it can impugn his character. It can impugn his character. So we've got to have this oh-so-simple but oh-so-difficult truth firmly fixed in our minds, in our hearts, and in our behavior, that we are all equal in our status before the perfection and glory and majesty of God. It should provide a reality check that provides us a starting point for true equality between God's, pe between God's people. And only that can cause true humility, which is the place where authentic forgiveness can occur. It provides a place where relationships are transformed to look the way that Jesus wants them to. When we take on that same humility that we spoke of a few weeks ago, when we're talking about the creed, Jesus' self empty humility, considering others better than himself kind of humility giving of himself relentlessly kind of humility. My hope is that the that simple truth of the gospel and it's a heart attitude that should cause humility as well as equality will cause us to pursue the Lord relentlessly. To transform our character to be like his. That's why I've been stuck in the talking about God's character. How do we resemble him? Therefore, my question is the same this week as last week. Do you believe it? Do you believe the good news? If yes, then how are you going to show it? Because if we believe it, our words, our character, our action, and our heart will show it. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, not only are you the, the author of our salvation, not only do you give us plans to prosper us in extraordinary ways, but you seat yourself in our hearts with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, make yourself real to us once more. Teach us true humility that reveals true equality. Come, Holy Spirit, and cleanse our hearts from all our unrighteousness, from all our artificial snobberies, who are putting each other in our arbitrary categories, and instead remind us that we are all united in Jesus Christ. I pray in his name. Amen. Time for us to continue in song and stand as we sing the cause of Christ.
seated, everyone. Let's continue in prayer. The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all a perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. Then he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit, that this bread may be to us the body of your dear Son. As we eat this holy gift, Make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We continue with the family prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. So I'm going to put a mask on. We're going to deliver the, the uh, communion bread to the, to the singers, and then I'll make my way down, alternating as we go. If you please come out of your pews, and I'll give it to the last person to come out first. That makes sense. All will be revealed.
we sing our closing hymn. Let's stand once more to be reminded of God's blessing. Christ, who has nourished us with himself as the living bread, make you one in praise and love, and raise you up at the last day. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Final hymn, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. to be a blessing to others. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to you.